Good evening, uh, and uh, thank you for joining us at this important webinar, which is to celebrate the International Day for Universal Access to Information. And to give us the context on that, we're going to start off with a short video. Hussein, my colleague, please can you roll the video? To celebrate the International Day for Universal Access to Information, join UNESCO in affirming and reiterating the urgency to respect and maintain the right to information, especially amid the COVID-19 outbreak. In times of emergencies such as the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to protect the right to access information so that communities can protect themselves and their families. Journalists debunk the falsehoods and report the facts about the disease. Scientists and policymakers provide us with directives and guidance on how to cope with the pandemic. Citizens can know the measures to prevent and mitigate the risks. That's why we need public information without delay with strong and effective institutions to keep citizens informed. Access to information is not a burden, but a right that needs to be supported by law. And any restrictions to this right should conform to the law, be proportionate and limited to protect the citizens. Join our high-level webinar on 28 September and all the online events across the world that UNESCO and partners are organizing to celebrate our right to access information. Go to our website for more information. Access to information, saving lives, building trust, bringing hope. Well, uh, greetings everybody. And again, welcome to this uh, webinar in the UNESCO series that is commemorating and celebrating the International Day for Universal Access to Information. Let me repeat, International Day for Universal Access to Information. It is not access to disinformation and misinformation. But the challenge facing us all is that access to messages and communications today includes having access to both information, disinformation and misinformation. So the challenge in this context is how can we reshape this access? How can we increase the supply and the circulation of information? And correspondingly, how can we diminish the supply and the sharing of disinformation? And how do we do all this without compromising freedom of expression? Well, an answer to this lies in a new book commissioned by UNESCO and published very recently under the auspices of the United Nations Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development. This book called Balancing Act is unique in two ways. First, it's a comprehensive analysis of different responses to disinformation may be the most comprehensive study that exists at this point in time of how humanity is responding to disinformation. And secondly, the book assesses how these responses are relating to that key human right, freedom of expression. Now, there are several questions that arise and which we will discuss in this webinar. One is, does the right to free expression give cover to and protection to the people who are doing disinformation or who are enabling its circulation? That's one question. The second question, do governments, our governments, have to live with disinformation as part of the package of respecting freedom of expression? Or are there some types of disinformation that can be legitimately limited in terms of international human rights law, which means that they could limit if certain expression is disinformational and it meets these, their limitation meets these criteria. It should be done in law, not arbitrarily. The law should be narrowly defined. It should be necessary and proportionate to a particular set of purposes. And those purposes are limited in international law, such as the protection of human rights or for the protection of public health. So do governments have to live with disinformation or are there types of disinformation that legitimately can be restricted under international law if they are, if the restrictions are legal, narrowly defined, necessary, proportionate, and for legitimate purpose, like the protection of the rights of others or the, or the right to public health. A third question is, 
through media and internet companies have to accept this information on their services because they have the flexibility to set their standards one way or another. And if they do decide to allow this information, does, does this mean that they let this content be freely shared, advertised, or even recommended by attention grabbing algorithms? So many studies and reports and the daily news uh, is telling us about the latest manifestations of disinformation. And as I said, this book looks at the ways that people are responding to disinformation. 11 modalities are identified about how people are responding. Legal ones, educational ones, technological ones, and so on. The book examines when these responses to disinformation, legal, technological, educational, etc., go further than just responding to disinformation and actually risk violating the right to freedom of expression. In other words, they also look at when the cure could be a bit more harmful than the disease itself that it is trying to respond to. From the research in this book is the following message, that disinformation and the, response, the responses to disinformation should not violate freedom of expression. In fact, freedom of expression in many ways can be part of the solution to the problem of false and misleading content. So addressing this complexity today is a set of super respondents. Uh, we'll keep it snappy. Each person is, is expressing their individual, not their institutional views. Each one will have two minutes maximum to answer a specific question. And we'll go through two rounds for them. We did invite Facebook today to join the panel uh, because they're a member of the UN Broadband Commission under whose auspices the study was published but they were said they were not able to provide a speaker. So we are less multi-stakeholder than would be ideal, but nevertheless, we have a good balance of gender and geography in this webinar, so let's just jump in. So my first uh, uh, panelist that I'm going to put two questions to is uh, Professor Kalina Boncheva. She's a professor, a distinguished computer science professor at the University of Sheffield, and she led the International Consortium of Researchers who wrote the study. Kalina, welcome. Let's start with trying to pinpoint what we're talking about. Uh, what expression is implicated as disinformation? What do you say in the study? How do you define what is disinformation? How do you identify it? Over to you, Kalina. Thank you, Guy. It's a real pleasure to be here today with everybody on this panel and with our viewers. Um, so the study uses the term disinformation uh, throughout um, the report broadly to refer to the content that is false or misleading uh, and has potentially damaging impacts. So for example, uh, these could be on the health and safety of the individuals, as you already mentioned, or uh, potentially damaging uh, the function of democracy during elections. So the focus uh, of this definition specifically of disinformation is on the impact of uh, this false or misleading information rather than, on the, rather than on the intention of those spreading that message. So uh, this is unlike other many definitions that have focused on the intent, but in this case, we are actually focusing on the outcome. And as we have sadly seen recently, outcomes are actually the most important uh, in many ways because the disinformation about COVID-19 has really cost some people sadly their lives. So for example, uh, you know, well publicized cases of people drinking bleach in the false belief that it will help them cure COVID. Moreover, um, as you noted yourself, disinformation can negatively impact citizens' rights to privacy, freedom of expression, and very aptly for today's International Day access to information. Thank you. Thanks, Kalina. Let me follow up with another question. Um, and this is, in the study of the book that we're talking about, the Balancing Act, and I hope one of the uh, panelists will post the link in, in the chat. In this book, you say that disinformation is different from hate speech and opinion. Disinformation is false and misleading content that is not the same as hate speech and opinion. Can you tell us a bit about how we understand this because sometimes these are obviously interconnected but in what way are they different as well 
Yes, thank you. That's a very good question. Um, so the disinformation campaigns, they do often employ hate speech and can aim to target, discredit or silence those who produce verified information, such as journalists, for example, or others who hold opposing views. Um, other examples are and targets, sadly, are often human rights campaigners or scientists or ethnic and religious minorities. So um, many disinformation agents carry out campaigns that uh, do employ hate speech, threats, intimidation, and disruptive tactics. However, um, even though there is this connection between them, there are often, uh, they are very distinct um, phenomena. Um, so there are many cases where uh, there is false information, for example, about vaccines, and that does not contain contain or employ hate speech and vice versa hate speech does not necessarily entail disinformation so uh, i think these are the main differences really in the way to think about these two concepts thank you okay thank you so uh, i think then we could understand that um, hate speech uh, particularly as incitement might be something that would use false uh, false information uh, to incite people into some kind of uh, public violence for example um, and that there are certain kinds of disinformation that might be punishable by law, such as that kind of incitement. And of course, everyone knows about the proverbial uh, restriction that you know one should not be allowed to shout fire, fire in a crowded theater, because of course that can cause a dangerous uh, stampede, a lot of panic. Um, but of course, there's other kinds of disinformation that are not combined with hate or incitement or or causing panic, uh, like somebody who says that the earth is flat. <laughs> but between the sort of the dangerous uh, disinformation or potentially dangerous disinformation and the earth is flat disinformation, there's a lot of gray area, like people who propose that if you drink lots of water or if you take hydroxychloroquine, this can help prevent uh, COVID infections. This is the kind of gray area. And so in these cases, we have to look again I guess, I guess that what is the potential harm involved, which is how you are treating uh, the, the fact of false content in, your, uh, in the book that you, that you have done. So um, if we've got a bit of a clearer idea about what we're talking about and how it differs to other forms of expression, let's look at who's involved in this. And now I turn to our second guest, Herman Wassermann. Herman is a journalism professor at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And Herman, you were very kindly part of the group of expert reviewers of this book, The Balancing Act, that we're talking about today. You made a comment on a draft of the book that it was important to look at the issue of motivations of media users who share misinformation or disinformation. So can you tell us what were the difference, what difference does it make to understand these motivations? How does this uh, impact on understanding uh, what kinds of responses to disinformation uh, would be appropriate? Herman, yeah. over to you. Thanks, thanks, Guy, and thanks for the invitation. It's a it's a wonderful book, and I'm very honoured to be part of this discussion. I think um, the question around motivations is, you know, if we know why people share misinformation, we can also try and design interventions that are more appropriate to those motivations. So, in our case, our research looked at specifically at African countries, and you know, um, we asked why would people share particular bits of information and what prompts them to send something on, even if they suspected or knew this might be false. And the two ma main motivations were one was for, for fun. People wanted just to share something because it's a joke or maybe connect with somebody around something humorous. Uh, there's also a longer tradition in, in, in African societies sort of sharing satire and jokes and gossips for more progressive ends. And the second reason was that there's a misplaced sense of civic duty and responsibility, you know, so want to warn people just in case. This might not be true, but we'll send this bit of information about plastic rice or 5G towers causing coronavirus or whatever, just in case it might help somebody. So it's that misplaced, I think, sense of social responsibility. Um, and I think in the COVID context, um, one of the motivations uh, might be that people are anxious. People are overwhelmed with information. Uh, it's unknown territory. You know, the WHO referred to this as an infodemic. You know, people don't know where to turn. There's um, overabundance also of information. So I think this can inform the way that we think about how to respond. So if we look at misinformation around vaccines, for instance, so some governments in Africa have 
criminalize misinformation around COVID-19. So if you spread misinformation around vaccines, you may be liable for prosecution. And that is quite problematic, I think, um, because just regulating it in that way, just criminalizing it might drive that anti-vaccine information, anti-vaccine discussion underground. It might not make it disappear, it just makes it go somewhere else. So instead of regulating and criminalizing it in that way, you know, one could maybe say, well, let's try and meet people where they are and try and find out um, are they maybe also doing this out of misplaced civic motivation, uh, civic duty? You know, are they concerned about the safety of vaccines? Do they know how it works? Um, you know, so in that case, education campaigns might be more successful than just criminalizing and regulating that misinformation. So rather try and explain maybe to people the medical facts around vaccines. Mm -hmm. But in other cases, I think if there are coordinated disinformation campaigns, you know, so uh, um, in one we've seen here in South Africa, for instance, a well-known the Bell Pottinger saga, where there's a concerted effort to spread disinformation and foment racial hatred. You know, I think their education might be less a less successful uh, measure of you know of, of of trying to stamp this out. So you also, when it's a very polarized political situation, maybe around elections, um, you know that disinformation can seriously undermine the trust in institutions, trust in democratic processes. Some of that information around a political candidate might stick and might be libelous. So in that case, I think when, when it uh, threatens to undermine key institutions, I think then, then regulation and even criminalization might be uh, something to consider. Um, so I think long answer to say that I think if we understand the motivations, if we understand why people do this and why people share some information, um, it might help us design um, more appropriate and differentiated responses mm -hmm. to misinformation. So uh, thank you for that. I think that's, that's uh, extremely nuanced and interesting. Just to, to bring it to a bit of a head, uh, where we do know about intentions uh, of the users and uh, if we make a difference between those who are deliberately deceiving and those who are innocent, even well-intentioned uh, sharers, um, would we say that there should be more liability uh, to having um, restriction of your expression if you are deliberately deceiving than if you're unknowingly doing so? In other words, uh, should the default be you're free to express yourself, but if you do it deliberately and effectively you're causing serious harm, then you, you could be uh, uh, liable for, to be in trouble. Is it a mitigating circumstance your, your intention or either way, if, if your expression can cause serious harm, are you, are you I mean, sh should you be subject to some kind of restriction? Well, I think that's a very difficult question um, because on the one hand, it's not always possible to understand or to envisage what the outcomes might be. Um, this is like, you know, consequentialism in ethics. You don't always know what the consequences of your actions will be. Um, and therefore, we often ha say that you have a certain duty to do certain things. So in this case, I think when the motivation of an actor, I think, would play a role in terms of trying to uh, eliminate it, as I've explained. Um, and, you know, I think there is, uh, it's probably, um, if, you, if you talk about a big, uh, orchestrated campaign, again, to use the Bell Pottinger example, I mean, this is a big PR organization work in cahoots with political actors, you know, that's clearly deliberate. And I think um, I would, I would argue that those sort of actors are more liable for prosecution than um, people that um, share this unknowingly, even though the outcome might be the same. Um, but I think it is um, important also to distinguish between the outcomes. So sometimes the outcomes in, a, in the case of a, of a, um, uh, dangerous information around, uh, as you mentioned, sort of uh, sort of uh, concoctions that people use, and you know, um, theories, conspiracy theories around COVID nineteen. I think those some of those outcomes can clearly be very dangerous and life threatening, and and you know they they require a strong uh, response because of the dangerous outcomes. Mm -hmm. So I think these two have to be uh, kept in balance and kept in tension in in a way. Um, but I think it is um, it is useful to try and understand the the intentions, um, especially when right. it, when it comes to to ordinary people sharing information rather than political actors. Sure, and of course, uh, in a, in a period when people are are, are are fearful or people want to help, uh, the, the 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 risk is that they get involved in this game even uh, unintentionally. But I'll come back uh, to you in a second round a bit more about the intentions. 
story. So we've touched on what with Kalina, we've touched on who's involved a bit uh, with, uh, with Herman. Uh, let's continue the theme and particularly look at how the disinformation is disseminating, um, which is a, a theme of this book. So our next guest is uh, Poita Dimitrovsky Lipsky, who is a broadband commission commissioner and a member of the working group that oversaw this, this research. He's uh, now also executive secretary for UTELSAT, which is an international uh, organization dealing with satellite coordination. He's formerly a broadcast journalist, a senior media executive uh, in Polish national television and was director general of the Ministry of Culture in Poland, which dealt with media and telecom issues. So, uh, Poita, thank you for being with us. Here's the, the question I want to put to you. Is, <coughs> often people, when they speak about this information, they think about politics or ideology, geopolitical issues, and so on. Um, this information can also be a, a business, can have a business dimension. Uh, one example is internet companies, they are um, removing or labeling some disinformation on the one hand, but on the other hand, we do see that, that the algorithms are functioning so as not just to allow disinformation, but even recommending it in some cases. So this business angle, is it intrinsic to the attention economics business model that disinformation will be uh, uh, sort of able to rise to the top or can that business model be changed? Over to you. Uh, thank you, Guy, and thank you for having me. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, well, your example is, uh, is right, and, uh, and this is actually a uh, foundation of the problem, because, um, yes, uh, it's uh, the business of this information is a business, and um, it's a business in its own right. It's not just a byproduct of some ideological warfare or, uh, or debate. And um, the players in the whole value chain, the actors, the platforms, are both harmed by fake news along the lines of, of your, your, uh, your example and also profit from them. The problem is that the harm is mostly reputational and uh, incidental, I would say, from one case to another. Um, but profits are real and what's important in any business, they are sustainable. Uh, you can budget them, you can put it in your business model. Obviously, you don't label them disinformation, but some other uh, sophisticated, uh, sophisticated uh, term. Now, um, it's very difficult uh, um, to uh, combat that, and I would get to that in, in, in just a second, but let's just give you some examples, as, maybe one example, because we don't have much time, as to how this business um, learns from itself and develops new product right? because the most basic thing is that you put some disinformation content which is attractive and it fuels advertising and that's uh, that's that's the core but um, we have uh, witnessed some more sophisticated uh, models that deal with placement of advertising uh, and this is more you know it's more and more or, or solely automated by algorithm and, and uh, um, means uh, of, of, of that kind. And uh, what you have is that uh, you have advertised uh, ads of legitimate products that are placed into, uh, onto uh, um, fake news sites or content like that. And uh, it fuels additional traffic. It legitimizes those sites. Uh, and you can take the model even further. Uh, you have ads of, uh, say, legitimate medical products, such as aspirin or things like that. And then next to you, uh, next, to, next to that, uh, you have ads for like hoax COVID uh, medication. So it legitimizes not only the, uh, the content, but the, but the whole environment, the whole realm, the whole, mm -hmm. uh, the whole system. And the paradox is, and it's a very sad paradox, it actually benefits everybody, including uh, the uh, advertisers for aspirin, uh, and uh, and this is and this is really sad. Now, um, so this is a business, and this is an intrinsic model that is sophisticated, and people know how it works, and actually work hard to make it work even better. Now, uh, can you combat it? Uh, there are many responses to disinformation, and I know that other speakers talk, talk about it, and we have already touched on that. 
um, regulatory uh, based on social business responsibility, policing and uh, uh, fact checking and all that. Uh, but I would say it is very difficult to find a new business model that would actually make people uh, make more money from truth than from fake news. And, th and this is a problem. And if I knew such a system, I would go into that business because that would be a proven moneymaker. Uh, no, uh, it's difficult because A, and this is coming from, as you said, from former uh, news person and media executive, it's far more costly to produce accurate reporting than to produce uh, disinformation. Uh, B, uh, disinformation can be more attractive because it's a form of creation, right? It's, you have creative people doing that, you know. Uh, think about in those terms. So it's sometimes it's, it's, um, uh, it plays on people's fears and um, feelings and so on. And finally, C, disinformation, as uh, we've already established this is a business, it's run a, like a business. It's sponsored, marketed, promoted like any other business. So um, uh, for the time being, I think that the jury is still out as to how to create uh, or whether it's possible to create a business model that mm -hmm. would, uh, that would uh, demonetize this whole thing in a, in a sustainable fashion. Okay. Thank you, Thank you for that. Uh, that that's uh, extremely provocative. And I think uh, I have to just ask you in a nutshell now, given that we have these engines, these machines that we have created, um, and the difficulty of having a machine that works with a different logic and a different product. Do you think in the end that the only way to have freedom of speech is to close down that business or can we somehow balance uh, uh, freedom of speech and combating disinformation uh, within the parameters that we more or less have? So, so you're, if I understand you correctly, you're asking me the perennial question about the trade-off between freedom yes. of speech and, and, uh, and, and fighting disinformation. Is there a trade-off? Well, there are two answers to it. The simple answer is yes, there is a trade-off. If you um, forbid somebody to do something or, or you close down some news outlet, it's uh, against freedom of speech in a very uh, um, cardinal way or a crystal way. But the not so simple answer, and uh, fortunately, not so simple answer is it depends on what we do as a societies, as societies, at what our uh, values uh, are. Because an act of com combating disinformation uh, can also be and should be, and uh, often is, an act of actually protecting free speech. I know it sounds Orwellian a little bit, but, uh, uh, but I really do believe in that. Uh, it all depends on assigning proper mix of vigilance or moderation uh, to the subject. Uh, you know, you deal with uh, the question that you asked, uh, like with any other public policy uh, question and decision. First, in, in a given situation, you analyze a potential trade-off in a, let's say, binary fashion, right? Uh, does this information in a particular situation exist or not, or is it just our... Uh, imagination, right? But after you establish that it does exist, then uh, you have to go further. Um, you need to assess more complex realities, such as scale of the threat, its relevance vis-a-vis uh, -vis society. You know the the relevance coefficients, if you uh, if, uh, if uh, or significance coefficients, if you want to use the language of statistics. Um, and finally, the causation, fighting not just simple existence or even simple correlation, but real causes or real harms. So uh, it is a trade-off, but how important it is to act, it depends on a kind of more complex uh, mm, uh, analysis. Now, um, if a government or, or a private organization, such as a delivery platform, a uh, social media platform, wants to over-regulate or institute preventive bans, uh, then perhaps such approach is a threat to freedom of speech. Uh, and this trade-off should be resolved in favor of the freedom of speech. Uh, however, when uh, regulation of preventive measures uh, properly identify and um, address relevant issues as they happen, it doesn't have to be a threat. So you need to act within the law, uh, within uh, mm, proper understanding of human rights, and very, very important, be transparent and honest vis-a-vis -vis the society. You have to explain your actions, uh, goals, objectives, uh, and why this particular situation is 
is um, threatening or is uh, disinformation. Okay, um, wait, uh, I need to uh, yeah. move on a bit if you don't mind, but thank you. I think you have a job ahead of you as the, the, the commissioner of trade-offs uh, in terms of this. We'll come back in another round to explore these issues a bit further. Thank you. Just to move on a bit now, we have uh, Mr. Sudipto Mukherjee, who is the resident representative so, of the uh, UN in Bangladesh. Uh, he works for UNDP, and I have a few questions for him very quickly. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Sudipto. So UNDP is concerned, of course, about the potentially harmful well, impact so of this information. That so the truth project that there's somebody results. whose mic is still on. Can people turn off their mics and then uh, we'll have Sudip to speaking in a minute. So the quest, first question to you from UNDP and representing the UN system in Bangladesh is why is UNDP, why would the UN system be concerned about the impact of disinformation on governance, good governance, stable institutions, uh, uh, I mean, wh why is this this thing disruptive? Thanks very much. Uh, let me let me start with a, 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 a bit of an admission. I have not read the report. A number of my colleagues have read the report and uh, actually sort of briefed me on the sort of salient features of salient findings of the report. So that's number one. Uh, number two, I am definitely uh, not an expert on the subject. But as a development practitioner here in Bangladesh, we actually have been supporting programs to do with uh, good governance, social cohesion, peace preservation, and in more recent times on the prevention of violent extremism. And as part of that uh, piece of work, we have been regularly trying to see whether what role does social media, uh, given the fact that you know, in, in Bangladesh is a nation of young people, and many of them are hooked to social media. Uh, Facebook is much more popular than Twitter. And the kind of narratives, uh, violent extremist narratives that you see on social media, we were a bit concerned whether this is further fueling uh, social cohesion or not. So the, the, we have a definite interest in that sense. But having said this, I, I just want to raise a few things that are quite important. And particularly, I was hearing the other speakers. And uh, I am one of those people who have actually been in the midst of two uh, pandemics. I was in West Africa during the Ebola outbreak and now in the midst of the COVID outbreak here in Bangladesh. And I still recall when the Ebola pandemic started in West Africa, I used to see huge uh, holdings all over the city in Freetown saying Ebola is real uh, because people just didn't believe it because, because people did not have the trust in government uh, they did not believe that it could be real. Now, so for me, the necessity of having a credible uh, sort of uh, messenger of messages, whether the uh, people having confidence in the government in public messaging is extremely fundamental to prevent disinformation. Because if you have a credible source of information, it is likely that people, and this is exactly what we have seen in even the COVID outbreak here, that ever since we started actually helping the government in producing and actually making public good information on COVID, uh, you know, the epidemiological information, it has actually reduced a lot of disinformation. So that's number one. Number two, I think personally, because you mentioned about freedom of expression versus whether how much can you really combat disinformation, my personal view is that we tend to overwork on the supply side of things. Uh, but I think if we were to engage much more on the demand side and actually, you know, invest in much more in digital literacy, uh, where uh, young people are taught to question uh, the information that they see and read, uh, and 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 actually question whether they, they're um, whether they're credible or not, uh, is is a, perhaps a better thing to do. It's not it's not an either or situation. I think we need to work for both ends. And the third one, which I think in, in the particular context of today's day and age where the whole world is connected, I think it's absolutely fundamental that there is some level of uh, international cooperation around information sharing. Uh, I have seen this particularly in the context of, say, uh, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, etc., that unless there is real-time information sharing, 
you could actually have a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. So in that sense also, it, it, uh, we, it, UNDP actually has a keen interest to make sure that, you know, uh, first of all, we, we would like to have a situation where people have trust and confidence in the government because that's fundamental to having good governance in the first place. We are able to protect uh, stability and peace. And, 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 and third is, of course, making sure that, you know, in, in the context of uh, uh, places like Bangladesh, we want to make sure that, you know, uh, uh, young people, there's a sufficient investment that is made on digital literacy, given the fact that many people without necessarily having gone to school have all access to mm -hmm. smartphones and have access to the social media. And interestingly, Dad, just to give you an example, we... Is it possible just to stop you there, just because sure, of sure. time? Sure, absolutely. I, I wanted to th thank you. Uh, indeed, this, as people will know, is the International Day for Universal Access to Information commemoration. The actual day was yesterday, but we have a, a week of activity. And exactly this message that uh, governments need to be transparent, output information, proactive disclosure to build trust as a way of not having a vacuum for disinformation is critical, the information sharing you spoke about. And thank you also for focusing on supply and demand, which complements what our previous speaker said about the, the transmission uh, the, and the, the business of transmission. But I, I, just to ask you, uh, because of time, I know that uh, UNDP and UNESCO, we're going to have a joint consultation, global consultation next week on how can this information be combated in terms of reducing its impact on polarization at a time when the world needs more cooperation, as exactly you said. Uh, and how can this consultation, we want to get suggestions on how to build trust. Tell us a little bit about this consultation, if, if you don't mind. Uh, well, you know, frankly speaking, uh, I, 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 uh, can you repeat, I, I, you mentioned about a consultation taking place next yeah. week. Okay, uh, uh, well, UNDP and UNESCO will be having a global consultation uh, next mm -hmm. week to try and look at what suggestions people have around the world to build social cohesion, increase trust against this information. So, uh, I mean, maybe not to go into detail now, but what do you see as, for example, in Bangladesh uh, uh, or in your region, what could be the most useful contribution besides, as you said, uh, promoting digital education uh, in terms of the, the way we can build more social cohesion, increase trust? Well, you know, frankly speaking, one of the other realities, particularly in a country like Bangladesh, is the huge digital divide that we have. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the one side, you have a situation where uh, through the digital space, a lot of disinformation is spreading, but the lack of access to digital, um, the digital world is also has its own downsides. And I think, you know, the, uh, you can uh, very conveniently feed disinformation through other means as well, not necessarily only digital means. So I think one of the things would be actually reducing the digital divide as much as possible. In fact, if you want to, inf I personally am one of those people who believes that it costs, uh, you, you could actually get a very basic smartphone for about $20, $25. And it's a good way of empowering people in multiple ways if you were to just give them a phone. Um, uh, if you again see the digital divide, even between the gender, it's again a, a serious issue in a place like Bangladesh. Uh, because 78% of uh, all smartphone uh, users are men. Women don't have phones. So uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a multiple way of actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's a good investment, not just in terms of digital education, but before digital education, give them digital access in the first place. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, also, that really brings us down to the ground because disinformation and freedom of expression, they can be abstract issues if we don't speak about the real access to communication that people have, the gender dynamics. Thank you. Those are great points. Let me move on to our next speaker. And uh, if you're able to stay, we'll come back to you. Um, but uh, now we have a, a, a very well-known journalist, Ritu Kapoor from India. Uh, Ritu, uh, you're an editor, a media, uh, media entrepreneur, an innovator. You've made a difference in the fight against disinformation through your, your media outlet, The Quint. And you've exposed disinformation as it's been used to incite and foment uh, communitarian violence in your country. Well, uh, of course, you'll be pleased to know this study has as a major theme about what a free and professional independent media can do 
uh, like exposing, debunking, investigating disinformation campaigns. It's, uh, it also covers how the media can curate their own content and about how media can support this digital literacy, media and information literacy. Now, uh, I want to go on, I want to ask you specifically wearing your hat as a journalist. Um, this information is often said as said to be or analyzed as seeking to win the endorsement and approval, the legitimization of being reflected in mainstream media. Uh, by mainstream media, let me say now I'm speaking about independent professional media. We'll come to some of the other media later, but I mean, the, the media that's reliable, the media that's in the business of journalism as opposed to other. How can journalists avoid being hoaxed? And how can journalists also avoid giving oxygen to disinformation by reporting it and giving it more amplification than actually, you know, it, it would get if it was not covered in the media? So uh, let, let me get into why, uh, how we got, how we as the Quint, as a young digital only independent journalist organization, how we got down to doing, to addressing disinformation, because we found that too often in a, in an edit meeting, we would say, oh, that piece of news, when I'm going to carry it, that's not true, that's not verified. There was just so much that, but, and yet we would see that, uh, you know, the bots and the algorithms and social media, which is, you know, India is a large, one of Facebook's largest consumer base, uh, the fake news was traveling and we realized that, that the way we have to look at journalism has to change and therefore fact checking or killing the oxygen, so to say, uh, being provided by bots and algos, has, there has to be some intervention there. And that's how um, WebCoof or our uh, fact-checking uh, 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 vertical was born. But we, what we also realized, and you know, we've been, other, 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 other panelists have referred to it, is that media literacy or involvement, or involvement of the audience we realize is really important. It's really important because, you know, the way we work is, of course, uh, you know, our journalists encounter fake news and they, you know, they debunk it and they do all the fact checking that needs to be done. But we also have completely opened ourselves to our readers participating in the scouting for suspicious content that they may find in the dark web. And I'm, when I say dark web, I even mean uh, private messenger pla platforms, which are sort of end to end encrypted, which journalists may not otherwise have access to. And then you're able to, uh, and if a reader brings that to your attention, you're able to fact check and you're able to intervene before it jumps onto a larger platform and gets amplified by bots which are pushing money behind it. So you're able to, it's, it's a preemptive action that's, apart from the fact that it also creates media literacy. Mm -hmm. By virtue of the participation of the audience, the audience is also becoming literate in understanding and in recognizing um, fake news uh, from uh, from fact. Uh, and I and I, but I think the one thing that is important is that journalists need to work with specialists. Now, for instance, there's been so much reference in this conversation so far on COVID. Um, we have impaneled a you know, a number of epidemiologists or virologists or doctors who are working with us in the debunking. So it's not just journalists and it's not so, so, so it's a tripartite, tripartite mm -hmm. uh, you know, effort with specialists, with the journalists and the audience participation. Yeah. And then we fact check and we plow that content right back into the same highways, social media highways, uh, uh, and, and right on the same keywords on which the fake news would have spread because it's important for fact check content to be as shareable, spreadable, accessible as fake news is. Right, right. So Ritu, that is really uh, fantastic stuff and, and congratulations. Uh, I think it's inspiring and encouraging. Um, that is a media institution like yours. Now I want to ask you if you have any comments or thoughts what to do with other media which is part of the problem of disinformation. I'm thinking of captured media or very strongly partisan media, even international broadcasting. So these are media institutions that, like all media, depend on the freedom of expression to do their job. But um, when they become complicit in disinformation, 
I mean, what, how, how do we engage them? I mean, what, in what way can they become part of the solution rather than being part of the problem? And not just complacent, but also complicit. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to give you a very, it's, it's because it's, it's, such a, it's such a, such a debate in the country right now. One of the mainstream TV channels carried a, um, a series saying that Muslims are infiltrating um, the administrative service, the Indian administrative service, and they called it a jihad. Now that in itself is, uh, you know, it's, it's hate speech based on disinformation because ours is a secular democracy. How can anybody of any community be infiltrating into any service? It, everyone has access to, it's a secular country. But interestingly, this matter went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court has been debating exactly what uh, we've been discussing for a while, which is that while this is hate speech uh, and it is yet to be verified uh, the, the basis on which they're saying that this is this could cause a terrorist to come into the Indian Administrative Service and you know sort of all, a, lot of, a lot of hyperbole around that is um, at what point does hate speech end and freedom of speech begin here? And that's been a debate in this conversation in the court. And the court, while they are, they put an injunction on this series of shows, but they're also saying that it eventually has to be self-regulation codes that have to come in, which exist, but which are being flouted. Um, and, and, and where do you, because in this instance, while there isn't a direct insight to violence, but you are impinging upon the fundamental rights of a community by giving the impression that that community is unsafe or that they are traitors or, uh, you know, basically you're also uh, threatening their very fundamental right to life. So in which case, where does, where does, and it is not based on, it is not based on fact. It is based on complete bollocks. So, you know, uh, where does, does, and then there have been interventions by other media, by right-wing uh, media organizations that have come in who have said that does the Supreme Court in a country like ours, in a democracy, does it have the constitutional right to legislate on permissible speech? So that's one argument that's come in. Another argument which completely out of the blue has come out from the central government saying, this is about the electronic media, it's about broadcast media, but let's start putting regulation, regulatory policy on the internet, on digital media, on digital news media, because there is no eligibility and there is no statutory regulation. So, I mean, we, we are, we're in the, we have a media that's complicit, that's complacent, that is crawling, that is, uh, you know, dealing, you know, which is happily part of the polarizing agenda that is unfortunately now the way of life here. Um, Okay, I, I'm sorry to jump in here, but to say thanks for that. Uh, and indeed, uh, I, I think um, to the extent that self-regulation is an answer, one hopes that these media houses that are complicit, as you say, that they realize, one, this is not living up to the codes of conduct, and two, it's riding a tiger that in the end will you know, get out of control and endanger everybody, including themselves. So uh, I, I hope some of them were listening to you. I hope to come back to you uh, a bit later. Let me move on to our, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Hesa Al-Jabbar. Uh, Dr. Hesa, thank you for joining us. And also thank you because you're a commissioner in this UN Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development. And you, you co-chaired the working group of commissioners that oversaw the study. So um, your career, of course, is also being First Minister of ICT in Qatar, and you currently lead your country's satellite company, SL1. Dr. Hesse, uh, can you tell us why the Commission on Broadband for Sustainable Development, why did it come to agree that uh, disinformation is a concern for, for, for it? What harm does disinformation cause from the point of view of the Broadband Commission? Thank you, Guy, and thank you for all the uh, wonderful speakers that uh, you are bringing today. I think uh, if you will, if, if, if I would like to explain why 
the abroad band commission will are they are really interested in uh, in uh, disinformation and the freedom of expression if you will if you will go to i think uh, uh, my assumption 90 percent of this information is being distributed through uh, broadband or through a network and so 100 percent this is part of what the uh, commission uh, is about and uh, in uh, in 2015 when when the un adapted the 17 sustainable development goals the commission was relaunched as the broadband commission for sustainable development to showcase and document the power of ict and the broadband uh, based technology for sustainable development and uh, there are a number of SDG who are really impacted by the use of broadband technology. So online disinformation does not only harm the right to information and undermine our trust in it. Disinformation can have life-threatening impact across all uh, SDG, including those in health and child safety and peace and security the role of law, democratic institution, equality, education, gender equality, and the list goes on. And if you if you will look to the um, to, if you will look to the um, uh, broadband or to the service providers, you will find that I mean, whether the, I mean the telecom or satellite or any service provider, you will find that they are the one who are spreading the online disinformation. And they are also the one who are implementing some of the response for the uh, disinformation. And this is where I think this is very uh, critical for, uh, for the Broadband Commission. And uh, I just like to share with you maybe something related to SDG theory, because everybody, I, mean, I, I know that COVID now is, is existing and everyone had uh, mentioned this. And I think when it comes to COVID-19, we know that, and this is a statistic, I, I, and I'm sharing it from the, from the report. Our report shows that one in four popular YouTube videos on the coronavirus contained misinformation. And also another study that also showed in our report found out that more than 1,300 anti-vaccination pages on Facebook had nearly 100 million followers. Yet accurate information is essential to save life. And I think this is where, this is very critical for the broadband mm -hmm. commission. Thank you for that. Uh, let me ask you a, a, a sort of follow-up question. In this report, there are many recommendations for different stakeholders that what they can do to balance freedom of expression and combat this information. Uh, is there any recommendation that speaks to you that you think is useful uh, for people to to hear about uh, now in the in the course of our webinar? Yeah, you know, I used to be telecom regulator, so this is where, um, and if I will go back and be the regulator for the telecom hundred percent, I will make sure that they should work together in a human right frame. And they, in order to improve technological abilities to detect and restrict force and misleading information, telecom, they really should develop uh, curatorially a response to ensure that user can easily access uh, journalism and as verifiable information. And they should also prioritize a news organization that practice critical ethical independent journalism. I will also, and if, if I am regulator, I will, emphasize, I will insist that if, if there is any health disinformation, they really should take the lead to just uh, take it out or prevent it from uh, accessing by the user. Also, I think uh, one of the concerns is the uh, political uh, disinformation. I think telecom operator, they 100% should be able to go and and I, I know uh, advertisement is a big thing, especially especially when it comes to the election. So uh, telecom operator should be able to do the fact-based uh, checking 
where they, whenever they will be publishing uh, political, or I mean, they, they, I mean, they are not publishing, but you know, they are the main uh, channel where we get all our information. So definitely I will go and force telecom operator to, to do this. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Hesse. Let's move on to Julie Possetti, who is co-editor with Kalina Boncheva of this book, uh, Julie, thank you for joining us. You're an academic, you're a journalist, a researcher, you're an advocate for gender equality. And amongst your many contributions to this book, uh, you designed a 23-step tool that any actor can use to assess if their response to disinformation, technical, regulatory, educational, etc., if their response is aligned to the right to freedom of expression. Uh, I think the point is made in the book uh, that there is a risk that legislative regulatory policy responses can risk violating freedom of expression. For example, criminalizing false information in very broad terms. Uh, the question I think that this raises though, are there legislative and policy response that can support freedom of expression uh, as a way to combat disinformation? In other words, it's not just regulatory uh, legislative as limiting expression, uh, certain kinds of expression, but can these responses empower other kinds of expression, legitimate uh, expression that will generate quality information, uh, democratic debate, uh, and, and the kind of uh, civic discourse that I think we want to see in, in, a, in a world that uh, needs cooperation, not polarization. Yes, really? that is the world we need. <laughs> Um, yes, the 23-step tool that you referenced, Guy, uh, was developed really as a way for governments and policymakers uh, around the world to ensure that their responses to disinformation did not um, unduly compromise uh, freedom of expression rights, notably press freedom, for example. Um, and the reason we emphasised um, the role of this tool uh, as a way of assessing potential overreach and compromise of uh, freedom of expression rights is because we saw in our research, very many examples, such as uh, the weaponization of so-called fake news laws, uh, which are extremely problematic and frequently catch uh, legitimate independent critical journalism in the net, for example. But as you say, there is a flip side. Um, and you know, th there are questions that do need to be asked about what regulation could look like, given we have a crisis of such scale that goes well beyond disinformation that is deadly in the context of COVID-19 to disinformation that is literally destabilizing and potentially derailing democracies. And we are, of course, in a period of uh, lead up to a very important US election. I'll just leave that thought hanging there. Um, so it does uh, bear consideration then what could be done in a regulatory way um, and, and how could we uh, flip this tool to think about that. And I think Dr. Hesse has given us um, a few excellent uh, possibilities there. I'm just going to draw quickly on uh, a few of the recommendations that we made and I think we made something like 83 uh, recommendations which uh, we were quite proud of but others might, um, <laughs> might uh, wade through them and tell us what they think are the best uh, recommendations. But we um, made a recommendation for governments that uh, they should, and states, that they should actively reject the practice of disinformation peddling, including making a commitment not to engage in public opinion manipulation, either directly or indirectly, uh, for example, via influence operations, which increasingly uh, we're seeing being produced by third party operators, the so-called dark propaganda PR firms. And I think that is a really important recommendation that applies not just to states, but also to political actors of all kinds. Um, and it reflects what we find in the research, uh, both within our study and in other research that's ongoing. And that is that we have two major problems when it comes to this issue of political disinformation, which of course does encompass a lot of the COVID-19 disinformation uh, that we're seeing, that among the biggest sources of disinformation are in fact politicians and elected officials. And the Twitter thread um, going as we talk is highlighting the point that uh, of course we have to deal with the source of the disinformation um, and that recommendation is designed to address the source. It's a very challenging problem. The other factor is that if we acknowledge that uh, among the main sources of disinformation are politicians and elected officials, 
we have the parallel problem of an ecosystem that we have now created, uh, which propels disinformation at a viral scale, at a global scale, uh, which privileges for reasons of profit um, that uh, Peter and others have, have uh, alluded to, um, and for other uh, motivations to do with the targeting um, of, of uh, consumers on those platforms. So we have uh, social media companies, which are also uh, complicit, um, many have argued in the spread of this uh, disinformation crisis, uh, the disinfodemic, as, as I think we called it in another series of uh, UNESCO briefs on this theme. So there's the enablers on the one hand, and Facebook is indeed uh, primary among them. And then we have the sources of disinformation. So that's a recommendation that goes to that issue. Um, and with regard to the platforms, uh, two recommendations that I think are quite important. Um, recognising that press freedom and journalism safety are critical components uh, of internationally enshrined freedom of expression rights. So that means that online violence uh, targeting journalists, which is a frequent uh, trend we see in reference to disinformation, uh, that the targeting of journalists, often with gender-based hate speech, uh, for example, um, can't be tolerated. Um, and the second recommendation I'll highlight uh, is the fact that um, we say that uh, fact-checking should be applied to all political content, including advertising, fact-based opinion, and direct political speech uh, that's published by politicians, political parties, their affiliates, and other political actors. And that does speak directly to um, a conflict that exists uh, in, in public debate, particularly with uh, Facebook uh, resisting those sorts of recommendations. Okay, thank you, Julie. Um, let's come back to you shortly uh, as I go through, but that's a good segue. I wanted to, to uh, go back to Kalina. Um, about this question of fact checking. Um, and you, you, Julie, spoke about the importance of fact checking political adverts. So, Kalina, um, I think that uh, in terms of defining what constitutes disinformation, the question of veracity, truth, is, is a key uh, aspect of, uh, of fact checking, which, in fact, you cover in depth in this, in this book. Um, and I think the book also shows that beyond isolated facts or falsehoods, this information is also about how people in, interpret uh, and use these uh, items of content and where they build uh, correlations. So um, at what point does the debate about disinformation get beyond isolated atomized facts and start uh, taking into account narratives, correlations, uh, conspiracies and so on. How, how do we deal with that? Because does fact-checking take into account these other kinds of um, more narrative uh, uh, weapons that are used by disinformational content? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good uh, question. Thank you, Guy. Um, so the uh, citizens' rights to express themselves freely and participate uh, in the online societal debates are, as we've said many times now, jeopardized by the online disinformation. And um, the fact, for example, that we have, um, you know, widespread beliefs that 5G causes COVID or that hydro hydroxychloroquine is a proven medicine um, for treatment of COVID. Um, these are unfortunately, um, you know, prime examples of disinformation and conspiracy theories that, that you mentioned. But when we look at them in isolation, we can see that, um, you know, fact checkers would say, yes, hydroxychloroquine is a proven medicine for the treatment of malaria and lupus. So they will admit that, um, you know, it is a medicine and it's proven to work, but just it's not proven to work on COVID. Um, and then uh, there is also, uh, you know, another uh, complex related conspiracy theory, which is about the existence of the COVID pandemic. But again, you have facts which will be fact-checked and point to the fact that yes, the pandemic does exist. Um, however, what we're seeing in the context of the disinformation is that these two aspects are frequently brought together. So we have cases where uh, posts and uh, political adverts and actor, political actors as well are um, are advocating the need, for example, to use hydroxychloroquine to treat COVID-19. And this is where uh, we have um, fact checkers, but also organizations like the World Health Organization uh, put out debunks that say, well, uh, no, uh, that 
usage is not proven, it's not labeled, but nevertheless, um, it's widely um, believed by a large number of users on the uh, on the platforms. And uh, as Julie just mentioned, uh, especially on platforms like Facebook, um, even though it is against the platform policy and this content would be deleted if I were to post it because it is misinformation, it's been demonstrated by who to be such, um, that will nevertheless remain. And uh, there are many uh, live adverts, for example, even now um, that propagate and amplify that uh, piece of misinformation, which are not taken down and they are exempt from fact-checking on the basis of it coming from political actors. So this is a major problem that needs to be addressed in that space as well. Thank mm -hmm. you. Well, what I take from you also uh, and from the book is that uh, truth and falsehood are more than um, just the question of, of isolated facts uh, because um, falsehoods are often buried in in amongst other facts or amongst opinion, and then they, they, they try and get away with the fact it's, it's sheer opinion, uh, or their false connections like saying, well, we this point in history, we see the rise of 5G and we see the rise of COVID, and then they make an illogical connection between two facts. So I think this begins to show us that uh, when we're speaking about freedom of expression, it becomes quite complex because we've got to go beyond the, the individual facts. And then, as you said, also as to how do we balance the public interest between who says something and whether it's coming from a, a particular leader or, or figure. So this is part of the, 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 the balancing act, I guess, that we need to um, deal with. So please stay with us. We have another uh, 25 minutes uh, of this very interesting conversation. I hope everybody listening here is finding it as, as fascinating as me. I wanted to uh, come back to Herman uh, Wassermann, Pro Professor Wassermann from Cape Town University, about this question of, um, uh, he was looking at motivations of, of those who share uh, 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 disinformation and misinformation. And I wanted to ask you, uh, Herman, you said that uh, you've, you've uh, um, drawn attention, I think, in some of the research that you've published that uh, there's a higher than expected resilience to disinformation amongst the public in several African countries. And I want to ask you about this. Does this show that uh, people have been inoculated against uh, disinformation just through self-taught MIL, <laughs> media and information literacy. Do people get this, this resilience to just through their own experience? Or are they just cynical and they don't believe anything in media or social media? Uh, and, and is this evidence perhaps that many people just see all expression not as a, as a right, but as a license to, uh, for nonsense to be propagated in, 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 in the public sphere? In other words, you know, do, do we see here a relativism that people treat everything as equally uh, uh, sort of lacking in credibility? Yeah, thanks, Guy. I'm, I think, you know, I'm not so sure about resilience as definitely as a higher than expected exposure or perceived exposure. So people have a very strong sense that there's a lot of misinformation around. Um, and, you know, that might, I mean, so the question is, that might lead to, as, as you've suggested, a sort of mistrust in information, you know, uh, in general. So people don't know what to trust. They think, you know, everything out there is, you know, skeptical about everything. And therefore, we might as well share whatever we find and, you know, let people make up their own minds, you know. So that's, I guess, that sort of free marketplace of ideas taken to the extreme. You know? and, and, and I think that is, that is obviously very problematic. But I think in, in the African context linked to this, I think what we have to also think about is um, just the general maybe um, low levels of trust in, in the media. And, and a lot of that has to do with uh, the history of state owned and state controlled media. So uh, for me, that raises the question not only about bad information, but also about good information. So we've been talking about, you know, how to counter bad information. But I think especially on a day like today, we also have to think about how do we promote and amplify good information. Um, so I think as we are thinking about regulating or, um, you know, should we regulate, should we legislate misinformation, you know, concomitant with that is, is we should also think about how do we amplify good journalism, quality journalism, independent media, public media, community media, and, and that is a big challenge in, in the African context. Um, where, there are, where there's a history of, as I've said, state-owned media, but also contemporary practices of repression of journalists, 
um, asymmetries in access to information. You know, we've heard about, you know, in the Bangladeshi context about access and gendered access to um, mobile phones, for instance, and the similar issues in, in the African context. So, you know, I, I, would, I would also flip that question a little bit and to say that, you know, um, there are broader structural political economic questions in, in African context that we have to address alongside disinformation interventions because um, this information does not occur in a, in a vacuum. So there might be a, a um, one could call it maybe resilience, might, one could call it maybe cynicism, but I think that, that is linked to the history and the structural issues in, in the African context. So I think that's important to address questions of quality information alongside combating misinformation. Thank you, Herman. So uh, again, uh, you've given us attention to the audience and uh, you're sort of speaking now about the, the supplier side, the production side and uh, and of course how history shapes these things so uh, let's let's come to the transmission side again a little bit so these are the the, the, the vectors between the, what unites supply and what unites the demand side um, and I, I want to ask Poita again uh, who, who spoke about this thing um, in recent decades Poita of course we've seen a, a process of convergence different platforms means of delivery, as well as audience have blended into one connected realm. And in this book, uh, we've seen that there's a phenomenon that disinformation jumps across the platforms. Uh, this suggests in a way that uh, maybe internet companies should have a more coordinated response um, as they already do, for example, in, in managing terrorist content. Um, and at the same time as if there was more cooperation and that could be very valuable in the fight against disinformation, how could we reconcile that with the interest in pluralism of freedom of expression and the diversity of standards of content moderation between these different companies? Poeta, what's your view? Yeah, uh, obviously uh, media convergence is a phenomenon as business reality that it's not only applicable to disinformation, but it's business of media as a whole. I mean, uh, there are all those traditional borders between print and electronic or radio and TV or linear TV and on-demand TV, all of that are very blurred and very theoretical nowadays. And uh, um, you, you, press has moved either entirely or partially online. Films are followed by games, games are followed by films and so on. And obviously in this, uh, this sometimes called information disorder in literature. And uh, you can flip that and you may say that uh, this information disorder is actually equivalent to disinformation order because it's a fantastic breeding ground of actually uh, not only spreading this information, but even if you take one step uh, back in the value chain of testing it, of uh, trying something uh, online, private groups and so on, then moving it very smoothly uh, or, and efficiently to, um, to other platforms. So yes, uh, it's difficult. Question about response, whether it should be coordinated or not. Uh, my point of view, it's kind of mixed. I think that should be coordination about uh, like meta knowledge about methods, about technologies, about uh, ways of doing that. So everybody knows what uh, other partner or competitor knows for, for the common good. However, in terms of just the merits of, of actually taking steps uh, uh, and uh, regulating this or coordinating, Mm, I think there should be a degree of competition and freedom between those who uh, who check and those who uh, respond to the information. And this is back to the very first point of uh, of our conversation: the trade-off between uh, freedom of speech and uh, uh, and fighting the disinformation. There, there, there should be. And you know, finally, I would say that we we have to admit and realize that we cannot regulate or fight everything. And, and that's okay, actually, because it's freedom. It's, uh, uh, we have also to give the reading and watching and viewing public uh, the right to, uh, to be exposed to different things and uh, be able to, uh, to respond to them uh, in their own right. So coordination, yes, in terms of technical knowledge and method and probably a little bit moderate in terms of actual actions. Thank you so much. So uh, I think you echoed your, your earlier comment that we shouldn't, should not have a binary. And in fact, this is exactly what I want to put to uh, Ritu now. 
Uh, so Ritu, uh, it's sometimes said that journalism should attempt to become the best available record of the truth, that it's a rough draft of history, which suggests that the role of journalism is recognizing that truth is a, is a process and that uh, you know, it's continually in evolution. Now, I think that uh, we can clearly say that there is a binary between some very established truths and some very proven falsehoods. But in between, there's a lot of unknowns and uh, because science is in progress, because policy measures may or may not turn out to be correct in the assumptions they have made about the future. But of course, many actors are claiming that these uncertainties are actually true or that they're false, uh, which has repercussions on who's going to then decide about the arbitrary, or who, who is going to arbitrate the truth of these in-between areas, between the binary truth and, and falsity. And journalism is dealing with these issues, often very fast moving issues. And journalism, I think, has an interest in keeping open space uh, for what is legitimate debate about the gray area, what is not yet a fact, uh, and what the existing facts, established facts may mean. So uh, how does journalism best deal with this uh, non-binary world, which some people want to shrink to a binary world? Bear in mind that we do have some established truths and falsities. <laughs> Um, you know, I can only speak to what I think, how we are dealing with this, with, with let's, let's, say, let's say the case of COVID, where something seems like a final truth right now, and then it seems like it's not, something seems like it is, there is a vaccine possible, and then it seems like there isn't. So um, I, think, I think the way news needs to look itself has to also change. I think it has to be more plural in its, um, in its approach. I think it has to be more explanatory. I think explainers now more than ever before, and explainers which are constantly trying to explain what is happening as against just saying, here's a fact, here's a report. I think that's, for us, the two formats that we, for instance, work with, one is explainers and the other is a format we call what we know, what we don't know. So at every point you're letting the reader know that this, this is a fact that is, has been established. What we don't know is a series of questions. So, you're, so the reader is with you on the questions rather than um, you're hiding the parts that you're not sure about. I think another thing that journalists today, and, I, and I'm definitely speaking about at the polarized environment of journalism in India is I think we have to watch out for our own biases. I think including, you know, liberal, whether you're right wing or whether you're liberal, I think it's so important to have diversity of voices in the newsroom. Um, because I think some of, some of the debate that needs to become part of the news will come from that diversity. And I think one, that's one of the things that needs to be addressed. I think the other thing that I think the platforms and advertisers need to work with in this current situation is to move news away from speed, keywords, trending topics. I think when you're trying to chase speed, keywords, trending topics, um, you know, that's, that's when things are going uh, wrong. That's when you're trying to, you know, sort of just constantly, you're stumbling over yourself and making a lot of mistakes. I think if you're able to move um, away from that, um, data. I think journalists need to be investing much more in understanding because data is not about just providing data. It's not just about data dumps. It's not saying here's data. It's helping readers, working with readers to understand how to interpret and slice and dice and relook at data because uh, because that's important. I'm, I'm, I, I, can, I can tell you that India is actually testing a lot, or uh, uh, and uh, or I can tell you that actually India is under testing. Um, where is the truth? Uh, so I think working with data is becoming. Um, and I, the other thing that is happening is that there is some amount of hijacking. I think keywords, etc., they hijack everybody into a herd mentality. I think it's important to focus on stories that some of the other people are not emphasizing enough. Mm -hmm. uh, I think those are some of the things that. Um, and I think journalism really has to relook at, we are no longer truth holders. We're no longer owners of information. We are truth seekers. 
And like I said, I believe that the audience is a participant in that, mm -hmm. uh, in that search. Thank you so much, Ritu. And uh, I need to jump on your reference to data because today we are commemorating, celebrating the International Day for Universal Access to Information. And indeed, information is based on data. Uh, in many cases, it's, it, information is what makes sense of data. And so we also need to think about access to the data in order to evaluate the information, uh, which is exactly what you were saying. And I think a, an interesting question today is also saying not just access to data held by, by the government under the right to, to information, but access to data accumulated by the intermediaries uh, who have a huge amount of data about disinformation, for example, where it's coming from, how it's spreading, um, who's spreading it, how coordinated it is, uh, you know, all those questions. And uh, I, I can see that if we really wanted to understand disinformation better, we would need access to more data on the part of, of the companies. And the companies, unfortunately, they're not here, but they would say they don't want to uh, make it easier for people to exploit uh, uh, the, the algorithms for uh, spreading disinformation. At the same time, those on the supply side and those on the demand side don't know what's happening in the transmission side. So, you know, we're working in the dark in the sense uh, without having access to that to that data. Now uh, we've got a, a, a bit of time, so I, I just want to ask uh, three more uh, questions to three speakers, and then we've got a few questions in the chat. So, I'm going to first ask Julie, then. Uh, uh, if Sudipto Mukherjee is still with us, I'll ask him and then I'm going to ask Dr. Hesse and then we'll go to the Q&A. So starting with Julie uh, Possetti, very quickly, uh, as co-editor of this book, um, can you comment on how you assessed uh, the notion of gender dynamics in the, in the book? Uh, where does gender fit into disinformation, freedom of expression? Over to you, Julie. Thanks. Um, minutes, and I'll try to be quick, but I think this is actually something that deserves time, the issue of gender. It's very important um, and it's a fundamental uh, barrier that we still have, that is um, the access of, of women and girls, not just to uh, accurate and reliable information, but also the fact that uh, women and particularly women journalists, uh, which is uh, brought up in this study, are frequently the targets of disinformation campaigns. They are often misogynistic, uh, in nature. So they blend uh, hate speech techniques with disinformation techniques. Uh, they're designed to chill um, critical reporting. They're designed to uh, malign the reputations of women. Um, we touch on uh, a couple of uh, case studies uh, in, in the report. Um, one of those that's mentioned um, is the um, emblematic case of Maria Ressa, uh, from the Philippines, uh, who is herself an expert on disinformation and disinformation combat as an editor, but also as a target of uh, prolific uh, state-linked disinformation campaigns, um, as she reports it, um, and as has been confirmed by other researchers. So I think it becomes very important to recognise um, that when responding to disinformation, uh, it's not just a case of one size fits all. Uh, the targets of disinformation um, are diverse and the impacts um, are diverse. And arguably, uh, if we take the case of uh, women journalists, for example, where there are now uh, mounting case studies indicating that the risks of targeted online violence deploying disinformation tactics such as um, deep fake videos, uh, memes, um, various reputational um, damage, that those uh, threats can cross over into the offline world. Um, with a great risk of physical harm. We've seen that, of course, at the intersection of racism, uh, hate speech, racism, oriented hate speech and disinformation. Take, for example, um, the crimes against humanity in Myanmar, uh, where UN uh, reports have indicated that as an issue. The same is true with gender. So we need to have not just a gender sensitive lens on this topic, but a, a proactive um, approach to dealing with the gendered issues. And this goes, um, back to uh, intergovernmental and, and state-based responses. Um, it crosses all of the um, other uh, spectrum of responses that we examined. But in particular, um, I would argue that there is um, a, a, you know, an implication here for uh, the, the platforms, for the social media companies, and some of them have started to take particular note um, of this phenomenon. 
Um, and I think that there is uh, certainly room to recognise the very specific gendered nature of journalism safety threats, for example, all bound up in these disinformation campaigns, particularly the more orchestrated ones. Thank you, Julie. Um, indeed, I think people have observed that disinformation by its very nature is antagonistic to information. And what you're adding to that is that it's also antagonistic to those who produce information, particularly those who um, are not seen as having a right to expression, women, for example. Um, and so I think this is, this is a super important observation that this information is a way to silence freedom of expression in, 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 many, in many ways. Let's move on now uh, uh, very quickly. Um, Sudipto Mukherjee, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Excellent, good. Uh, in, in one minute, <laughs> could you say something about your position as UN resident coordinator uh, in, 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 a, in a member state of the UN? This information and elections, what can UNDP, of which you, you're, a, you're, a, you're a staff member of UNDP, an official of UNDP, senior official, elections and disinformation? Uh, what well, we uh, I, I can tell you what we tried to do, not very successfully in the last elections, was basically we have been investing in, in a part of Dhaka University, which is uh, one of the reputed universities here, in setting up what is called a Bangladesh Peace Observatory. And the Bangladesh Peace Observatory basically was doing media scanning and actually making sure that uh, disinformation was not uh, spreading. So... Uh, and, and we also worked with a lot of the media journalists, actually. We have, uh, this was something that we worked uh, in terms of building their capacities for much more responsible reporting, not to become complacent or complicit, as one of the previous speakers was saying. So a range of things that we worked. Uh, one major area is actually also making sure that the entire, uh, you have the, the coalition of the international partners that we can convene to actually make sure that our voices can be amplified because again, if you're working in, in countries where it is often very difficult, to, governments are increasingly uh, uh, much more uh, sort of in a sense, uh, they don't, if they don't like something, they uh, don't necessarily uh, are willing to listen to the UN. So again, uh, convening uh, the larger development partner community was something that the UN did quite successfully and making sure that we all spoke in one voice. Thank you so much. In fact, you're, you're channeling the, the book, which recommends the multi-stakeholder approach. <laughs> so well done to, to you for that. Uh, we, we're out of time now, so again, I'm going to ask Dr. Hesse to make some final words. Um, I see that some people have um, put Q&A in the chat. Can I ask speakers to uh, those panelists to re respond in the Q&A if they have answers? But um, in the meantime, let me just uh, ask Dr. Hesse, this question, you've underlined at the Broadband Commission that this book should have real impact. Can you tell us what are the challenges of converting such a comprehensive study into something that's practical? What, what can be done in this regard? Dr. Heather. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I think uh, it will be great if this book will be translated in uh, several languages. I know that we are in the process of do, doing the translating in, uh, in uh, Arabic. And I really like to re-emphasize that this, uh, this report, 100% is a multi-stakeholder engagement. And, and every one of us is responsible to make it happen. One last point, and I'd like, um, I'd like to emphasize what Herman has mentioned. Uh, yeah, and I think if you will go, yeah, we, we, we talk about uh, regulator, I mean, uh, regulation, but we cannot regulate everything. Uh, Social media, they are big uh, company, 100 person, they will, whatever they will be designing, it will be driven by their the dollar and commercially. I do believe that one thing we have, it's education. We really need to start educating, uh, uh, educating our kids how to think critically and how to just process anything. Uh, I know we can use everything, but I do believe that media literacy uh, and media education should, should start from, uh, yeah, from school as young as uh, maybe uh, uh, kindergarten now.
I think that's what I would like to see. And I would like to thank the, um, uh, the authors of this um, report. And I, I do believe that the enlightened that you had put there, it's amazing. And I think it's unique. I really, uh, and I like to also thank the, uh, rev the reviewers because all your input had been amazing. And we have now very unique report that will stay, I think for me, it's kind of one of the pride things that the Broadband Commission did. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hesse. And indeed, I need to just tell people, I don't want to embarrass you, but Dr. Hesse has taken the lead to organize resources to translate the study into Arabic. So she puts her action where her words are. So thank you for that. And. Anybody else who can help uh, amplify this, this report in different languages, different audiences, if you want to organize a webinar, please get hold of us. I see, for example, um, in the Q&A, IFEX, the network of NGOs that promotes freedom of expression, has uh, discussed what resources they've got. We'd love to engage with you in a public webinar. This is a time when people are experiencing Zoom fatigue. I do not feel fatigued by this uh, engagement. I feel very stimulated. It's been super the quality of, of dialogue. I'm really sorry we couldn't also have more interaction with the other participants, but I think it was lively with all the different uh, speakers in the panel. I wanna thank them all and uh, I wish you a fantastic um, week of celebrating access to information. There are other very interesting webinars coming up. Please check the UNESCO website for them. And so thanks uh, to you all and have a, a, a wonderful day the rest of the day. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.